agenda today is to look at the first two chapters of Bolt's lecture. Um, those of you who had a chance to look at the reading, and no worries if you did not, um, we'll see that, that um, the setting that I was describing last time, the fact that these lectures are taking place in the semi runs of the Electoral Palace. Uh, those of you who are following along at home, that's on page seven. Um, Bart says that he was giving these lectures there the hour of 7 a.m., always after we had sung a psalm or a hymn to cheer us up, which I love. Always about eight o'clock, the rebuilding of, in the quadrangle began to advertise itself in the rattle of an engine breaking up the ruins. And so you can imagine Bart lecturing in a building much of which is in runs, and you've got earth movers outside, which are interrupting his lecture. Uh, he gave these lectures not from a manuscript, as I said last time. He took the italicized portions, which are at the top of each chapter, and he would riff <laughs> and improvise on those italicized portions. Um, the italicized portions were written down. That was his outline. That's dogmatics in outline. And then he would elaborate on the outline in the form of his lectures. This book was produced because it was, um, for any of you who are new this week, because it was, um, it was a student who transcribed the lectures as they were taking place, and then they were eventually published, translated into English, and so on. Um, it's interesting that in the foreword, Bart says that this book smacks of a document of our time, on page eight, which has once more become a time between the times and that not only in Germany. Lastly, I said to myself that the Christian confession can not only stand, it even demands interpretation in such a key and tempo as you have here. It'd be interesting for us to think about what exactly is the key and what's the tempo in which this book is written and why is it that Bart thinks that key and tempo is necessary for the age in which he's living, right? Um, perhaps we could close these windows. Could you all like my help in doing so? I love the sound of kids. A church without sound of kids is dangerous. Uh, you all are extremely polite, so you, 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 you're not saying you can't hear, but I can see it on your faces that you can't hear. Uh, okay. Which is always a difference. It makes a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's Canaanites, we're, all, we're all so nice and polite, right? It's all good. You can just say, hey, I can't hear. Uh, the people on Zoom will definitely tell you if you can't hear, right? Um, anyway, so I want for us to keep in the back of our minds that this book is written in a particular key and tempo. Somehow he thinks it's appropriate to the time in which it's written and the setting in which it's uh, the setting in which it was delivered. Um, I think that this book is written in a key and a tempo which is appropriate for our time. And mm -hmm. so we might think about that too. Mm -hmm. I'm also just going to flag here the musical metaphor, right? Um, Bart is a massive fan of music, particularly Mozart, for any of you who are joining us for the first time today. Uh, and I think it's meaningful, it's significant that he is writing this and he uses the metaphor of key and tempo to describe what he's trying to do in his theology, right? He's not literally writing music, but he describes it using a musical metaphor. Just an interesting rhetorical device. No wonder you like. Yeah, no wonder I like it, exactly. <laughs> um, so with that, that's enough about the forward. Um, the forward was included in the PDFs on Realm, but I didn't ask you to read it. And again, if you don't read anything in this class, it's all good, just show up. Um, my job is to have read it and then to explain it. Uh, if you guys read it, that, that's all good, but it's just bonus. Um, first of all, we need to talk about what is Bart doing? And he says that he's doing something he calls dogmatics, which disappointingly to me has nothing to do with dogs, um, but it has to do with dogs instead of dogs. Uh, so we're gonna, we need to discuss what dogmatics is, and then we're going to begin three chapters on faith. So Bart breaks down faith into trust, knowledge, and confession. This chapter is faith is trust. 
And faith is trust is the foundation upon which all the others are built. This is the primary chapter. Um, a bar may not like it that I've described it in that way, but that's the way that I read them anyway. This is this is the place where it all gets started. This is the foundation upon which everything else sits. So I want to just briefly explain what dogmatics means for him. We have a negative connotation to the word dogma, right? Uh, many of us, especially if we are Roman Catholics, we're very familiar with something called dogmas. Dogmas have the reputation of being things you have to believe, right? And if somebody is dogmatic, that means that they are annoying. <laughs> They're annoyingly uh, prideful, demanding, imperious about other people believing what they say they ought to believe. So we hear dogmatics and we're like, oh no, that is like the worst of religion. Well, I'll just say, for one thing, Bart is writing in a German context, okay? And dogmatics in the German university, uh, in the German speaking university world means something different than what dogmatics means in English. What they mean by dogmatics is something like what we would call systematic theology. Uh, Marianne, in my first years uh, here at St. Mark's, Marianne kept asking me, what is systematic theology? What is systematic <laughs> theology? Well, I'm about to give you an answer finally, uh, some 10 years after I arrived at St. Mark's, what systematic theology is. I'll note that in the forward to the paperback edition in English, Bart says he's not doing systematic theology. So um, the reason for that is he's concerned that systematic theology, especially as done by some really famous American theologians in the 20th century, like Paul Tillich, who wrote the book Courage to Be. Uh, Courage to Be used to be like just on people's, I mean, it very well may have been on many of your parents' coffee tables or their bedside tables. Courage to Be was an incredibly famous book and read by people who didn't go to church, just read like people read Oprah now. Uh, Paul Tillich was like an Oprah of his day. He just happened to be a theologian and taught at Union in um, New York City. Tillich wrote a systematic theology and Bart thought it was a terrible, um, terrible idea to do what Tillich had done. Tillich took an idea about the human person and what it meant to be human and then built his theology around that account of the human person. Um, so it's like, if you believe X about the human being, then you must believe Y and Z about God in this direction or that direction. He thought that was entirely the wrong starting point. Bart wanted to start with God, not with any account of human beings. Um, I don't think Bart is being completely fair to what's known as systematic theology now in the United States. Um, systematic theology is not just systematic theology as done by Paul Tillich. Um, but anyway, if you're confused about why I'm saying dogmatics is systematic theology, when Bart said, I'm not doing systematic theology, that's why he's fighting. This is an infight between him and one of his, and an, an American contemporary. Um, Bart says that dogmatics is, first of all, a critical science. So I'm gonna break down both of those words, critical, and science. Science here doesn't mean something like biology or physics. Uh, the word science comes from uh, it comes from the Greek or uh, the Latin brand. It's the Latin scientia, which just means knowledge or study. Um, so this is just the study of something. <laughs> and the study of something Bart says in the first couple pages of chapter one has two dimensions, which he calls investigation and doctrine. Now, the word doctrine is only a little bit better in connotation in English than dogma, right? Um, nobody's very excited about this book anymore because it's all about dogma. It has nothing to do with dogs. And Bart says that there's something about doctrine on the first page of the actual book. Um, here's, but all he means by this is that there's an investigation, there's an, uh, a curiosity, which is trying to break something down into its component parts so that you can understand it. Okay, so science is first of all an investigation, and then it's a proclamation of some kind, it's a teaching. So all doctrine means, doctrina in Latin means teaching. Okay, and so there's a teaching element 
to this science, Bart would possibly say to any science, right? The biologist has to actually like have, find a discovery. They have to investigate. Then they have to publish it. They have to tell people about it. They have to explain it. And that explanation is just as much of the science as the discovery bit. And in this sense, almost anything could become a science. What differentiates sciences from one another are their objects of investigation and teaching. And the object of Christian investigation and teaching is, let me see here. Easy say it most simply. Page 11. <coughs> what as Christians do we really have to say? Or elsewhere. I can't find the place where I can't find the page number for you, but the the um, it is the history of the relationship between God and the world. Well, I wish that I could find the exact um, the exact page for you, but you all are probably fine without the exact page. So the object of this study and this investigation is God, not a human being, which was his problem with Tilly. Um it's God. <clears throat> what makes this, what makes dogmatics a critical science? It is, dogmatics is always trying to, um, is trying to test something. So all that critical here means is it's trying to test something. And what it's trying to test is the church's proclamation of this God. So this is on the bottom of page 12. Dogmatics is the testing of church doctrine, church teaching, and proclamation, not an arbitrary testing from a freely chosen standpoint, but from the standpoint of the church. So that means that dogmatics is testing Christian proclamation, not from outside the church, right? These are not skeptics. Um, so um, Schleiermacher, 19th century German <laughs> theologian against whom Bart is reacting, although Bart has a lot of respect for him. Uh, Schleiermacher represented um, one of the theological liberal thinker, theological liberal thinkers that I was speaking about last time. Theologically liberal thinkers who Bart is concerned led the German church down the primrose path into not having any means to resist Nazism, um, because they were so focused on stuff about human beings rather than focused absolutely on God as Bart would have them to be. Um, Schleiermacher famously wrote a set of lectures. The lectures are entitled On Religion or Speeches to uh, Religion's Culture Despisers something like that and bart is not writing to the culture of despisers of christianity dogmatics he says is not about that you're not writing to stephen hawking you're not right this is not stephen or excuse me it's not so much that you're not writing to stephen hawking that dogmatics is not stephen hawking criticizing the church it's not richard dawkins criticizing the church it's not um I just not pick your favorite celebrity here criticizing the church. It is the church criticizing itself. Dogmatics is the church testing its proclamation against the revelation of God. So top of page 13, the concrete significance of this is that dogmatics measures the church's proclamation by the standard of the Holy Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. You can think about this in a very simple way. Just trying to figure out if the church's proclamation is actually accurate to the word or not. That's what dogmatics is trying to do. Now, what do I mean by the word? He did say here 
by the standard of the Holy Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. The next sentence on the top of page 13 says, Holy Scripture is the document of the basis of the innermost life of the church, the document of the manifestation of the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He's just made a very, very subtle move there. So I'm going to read that sentence to you one more time. Holy Scripture is the document of the basis, the document of the manifestation of the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So, Bart's theology of scripture is you have a book called the Bible, and the Bible, the reading of this book will get you to Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the revelation of God. Jesus is the word. Jesus is what dogmatics is testing the church's proclamation against. Reading the Bible is how we get to Jesus. The Bible is called the word of God by a kind of property of transference. The Bible is the word of God, not the words of God. We would call it the words of God, Bart would say, if the Bible was itself the revelation, and that's all. That's, that's where it stopped. Jesus is the revelation of God. Jesus is God revealing God's self to the world. And the Bible gives us access to Jesus. Bart famously says in his church dogmatics, his much longer than like, you know, I can't remember how many volumes it is, something like 16 volumes, 16 volumes systematic theology. Um, he says in the church dogmatics that God can speak through anything. God could even speak through a dead dog if God wanted to. It just so happens God speaks regularly, persistently through the words of the Old and the New Testaments. This is actually, um, this is an aside, but Kevin, this is, I did some research. This is part of a response to the question you posed last time about other religions. So Bart would be open to God speaking through other religions because God can speak through anything, right? God can totally speak through anything. God for Bart is radically free. And God can speak. God can speak through different religions, through different philosophies. Uh, God can speak through anything, even a dead dog, if God wanted to. Um, it just so happens that God's revelation in Christ was conclusive, exhaustive. He would say, um, and it is for that reason the preeminent manifestation of God. But it doesn't stop God from speaking in these other registers in these other places and so on um anyways, that's that's a, that's an aside i don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much but that would be that would be the way that bart would respond to your question um what dogmatics is trying to do is dogmatics is trying to test what is the church saying with who jesus really was that's all it is and i wanted to break that down in a by walking through those first couple of pages to just help you get some facility with the book to help you to read it. But that's that's all the that dogmatics is. Testing the church's preaching and proclamation of who Jesus really was. And you know who Jesus really was because of the Bible. The Bible gives us access to Jesus. Um, this becomes clearer in the next chapter on page 17, where Bart says, in calling Holy Scripture the word of God, and we call it so because it is so, we mean by it the Holy Scriptures as the witness of the prophets and the apostles to this one word of God, to Jesus, the man out of Israel, who is God's Christ, our Lord and King in eternity. Okay, so the Bible is the word of God because the Bible witnesses to Jesus. Jesus is the one word of God. Uh, Bart would have a lot to say about um, Protestant fundamentalists who seem to deify the Bible, right? Uh, the point of the Bible is that we access the God of Jesus Christ, nothing particularly um, nothing particularly perfect, holy, etc. about the words themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what dogmatics is. Now I want to say a word about faith is trust and then take a few questions. And then, as I promised you last time, so Mozart, uh, which I think will explain everything a lot better than I can. So faith is trust. 
many of us, many of us think that um, we have any kind of inchoate, natural sense of God. We kind of grow up with an idea of God. Maybe there's an idea of God which is implanted in every single human heart. Then over time, we discover that this God happens to be named Jesus. And then we kind of interpret this idea of God, which we've had all our lives, through Jesus. Mm. Bart would say that's kind of right, but mostly wrong. <laughs> it's mostly wrong in the sense of direction, right? So the story that I just told you, that every single human being grows up, every single human being is born with a kind of inchoate idea of God, that would be human beings thinking their way up to God. And you can already guess this arrow is moving in the wrong direction for Bart. There's a second way that most people think that we end up believing in God, which is that we convince ourselves intellectually of the existence of God, and then we convince ourselves intellectually that this God happened to be revealed in Jesus, right? That is, again, another version of this. Whether you think that your idea of God is like in Coet, um, something that's like just within every single human heart, you have this abstract idea of God, and then that abstract idea of God becomes Jesus. Um, or you think that you have to read all these proofs of the existence of God, like you read a lot of C.S. Lewis, you become a theist, that is, you become somebody who believes in God, and then later on you read some like Josh McDowell or somebody like that, or you read the rest of mere Christianity and you move from believing in just a God in the abstract to believing in Jesus. Um, you know, that's just another version of let's think our way up to God. Bart says, no, nine. Wow. <laughs> uh, you can already guess. Nine, no. Uh, why is this a problem? Well, he's going to say later on, if this is the direction in which you're moving, you're just going to come up with a monster. You're just going to imagine a monstrous God. Uh, he has a, a really pretty incredible um, passage about this later on. Uh, it's always response, again, to respond to Kevin's question last time, like to the extent that Barr believes that people of other religious beliefs have an accurate idea of God, it's not because they've reasoned their way up to God or because there's some infelt universal human idea of God which they are expressing through their religion. It's because God has happened to speak decisively through whatever their religious belief and practice is. The arrow is always going to go in this direction from God to us, never from us back up to God in this sense. Um, it's just because God God uses the, the, the words of this human book, the Bible, in order to speak to Christians, in order to reveal Jesus Christ to them. God can speak through other religions, religious practices, in order to um, give them the revelation of God in Christ too. But it's not that they're, they're not moving. If the arrow is still going in this direction. God is still the one speaking, and we're the ones hearing rather than us reasoning or feeling our way up to God. So what does this mean for faith? It means that faith is um, not rational. He's going to say in the next chapter that faith illuminates reason. Faith illuminates reason. Uh, it has a kind of reason to it. It strengthens your reason. Um, Ideas about God, ideas about Jesus make a kind of sense to you. It's not completely irrational all the way down. But coming to faith has nothing to do with your reason. Coming to faith has nothing to do with your reason. If you believe as opposed to not believing, it does not, it has nothing to do with whether you read mere Christianity and were intellectually convinced. He doesn't think that's faith. Even the devils have faith of that kind, right? Even the devils, even the demons believe in the existence of the Trinity. <laughs> it's not it's not like they believe intellectually that yeah okay the trinity exists it doesn't mean they have faith right uh faith for bart is a meeting oh my God. and faith describes the subjective effects of that meeting Subjective meaning in the subject, in us, right? Like I is the subject of the sentence. We are the subject here. 
So these are the effects in us of this meeting. This meeting is the meeting of God and the world, downward arrow, in Jesus. And faith is what happens in each and every one of us when we meet Jesus. It is all of the consequences of our meeting Jesus. And he says the first consequence of our meeting Jesus is that we trust him. Uh, so I'm just going to, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through a couple of these pages and I'm going to, but I'm going to, I'm going to rewind just a little bit in what I've been saying. <coughs> first of all, on the downward arrow, not the upward arrow. So Jesus says, uh, Jesus says, that was a Freudian slip, sorry. Bart says uh, <laughs> that faith rests not upon a human possibility and human initiative, nor on the fact that we bear in us a capacity to meet God, to hear his word. Rather, at the top of page 18, it is itself a recognition of faith to recognize that God is to be known only through God himself. So it's not that we have a kind of God organ in our heads that allows us to think about God. It's not that our reason is able to reason our way up to God. It is simply that God meets us in Jesus. We are overwhelmed by this meeting and we throw our whole lives over into his care. That sounds a little more dramatic than what Bart means it, uh, than, than Bart's language. Although Bart's language is also pretty dramatic. Here's the way he talks about that throwing your life over into his hands. Um, he says on page 18 at the bottom, faith means trust. The trust is the act in which a man may rely on the faithfulness of another, that his promise holds and that he demands, excuse me, that what he demands, he demands of necessity. So, God meets us and the world in Jesus. God comes in the flesh and meets us. God continues to come in the flesh and to reveal God's self to us through the words of scripture and through the sacraments. Meets us in our response. I'm going to put this arrow in dashes because <laughs> it's not, it's, it, it's only the result of this downward arrow, right? But this is, we trust God. So faith is a relationship. It's not just trusting that something is true, right? It's not just trusting that Father Justin is telling you the truth that Jesus is God, et cetera, et cetera. It's that you trust. You trust that God is going to take care of you and is going to be with you. And it really is kind of that simple. Uh, he says this on page 19. This is the promise God gives us. I am there for you. That's it. And he says um, on page 16, in our glory and in our misery, we men are not alone. God comes to meet us. And as our Lord and master, he comes to our aid. That's the good news of Christianity for Bart, is that in the wake of, as he sits in the dismay, in the catastrophe of Western civilization that was the two world wars he's sitting there sitting in that catastrophe saying oh my gosh it's incredible that god comes to meet us in jesus and the message the promise of this god is that god will never leave us nor forsake us he has come he has met us he has come to help us and his promise is i am there for you we respond in gratitude and he's going to explain that faith also has an element of obedience in it, but it is first and foremost trust. It is just the effect of meeting this person. It's like um, some people say that when they meet certain people, they have a feeling about them. It's like their hearts are moved towards them. Um, people talk this way about um, former Archbishop of Canterbury, Ronald Williams. They talked about him like he had a kind of aura of holiness around him. People have uh, talked about Her Majesty the Queen in this way you just step into their presence and something happens and you're like oh my gosh i'm going to follow this person or i trust this person it's very intuitive right 
and it encompasses your whole self. That's close. That's a lot closer to what Bart means by faith than thinking that it's about um, believing a thousand impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> it's not actually that cognitive. It has a cognitive dimension. We'll take a look at that chapter next week. It illuminates your reason, but it's not based on your reason at all. In fact, on page 20, he says that the believer in God's word may, God's word meaning Jesus, the believer in God's word may hold on to this word in everything in spite of all that contradicts it. We never believe on account of, never because of, we awake to faith in spite of everything. So faith has an in spite of character, which means it's perfectly compatible with doubt. Faith and doubt don't even operate on the same existential plane. The opposite of faith is unbelief. The opposite of belief is unbelief, not doubt. Uh, doubt at the bottom of the page here. Bart says, do not be afraid. Regard even that. We could say, I've not read the rest of the paragraph. You could say, regard all of this as an invitation. One may, of course, be confused and one may doubt, but whoever once believes has something like an indelible character. He, he put, lays it in the, in the Latin, like a character indelibilis. Uh, he's referring there to the, um, the indelible mark that Roman Catholic theology, that medieval theology felt was placed upon each person who's baptized. There's an indelible mark, a permanent mark. Your mark is Christ on forever in baptism. The bar is saying, whoever's believed once, whoever has met God once and throws one's life over into God's care and trust and says, I trust you to be there for me, believes once and for all. And the vicissitudes of our lives, the ups and the downs and the ups and downs of our beliefs and doubts, they follow they follow, and God is with us in all those beliefs and doubts. But those beliefs and doubts do not cancel out this relationship of trust in which faith really consists. So um, I've got two quotes here before I take um, 10 minutes worth of questions and Mozart. Um, one is that um, One focuses on the fact that this faith is, we might call it existential rather than intellectual or even religious. So Bart is really concerned that there is a thing out there which people think of as religion, and then they try to fit Jesus into that box. And religion is something that has to do with like rituals or a movement of the heart or a set of believing of you know, a, the, an exercise in believing a set of impossible things before breakfast. Um, that's a riff on a Lewis Carroll quote, by the way. Um, but anyway, he's really concerned that people have an idea of this thing called religion, that they're going to try to fit God into the box of religion, when the whole point is to let God be, let God define God's own box. And God ends up not fitting into any box, and God ends up actually claiming the whole of our lives. That's what I mean by existential, claims our whole existence. So here Bart says that faith is not concerned with a special realm, that of religion, but with real life in its totality, the outward as well as the inward questions, that which is bodily as well as that which is spiritual, the brightness as well as the gloom in our life. Faith is concerned with our being permitted to rely on God as regards ourselves and also as regards what moves us on behalf of others, of the whole of humanity. It is concerned with the whole of living and the whole of dying. The freedom to have this trust understood in this comprehensive way is faith. So you might be asking, what about people who don't believe? What if you don't have faith? What if you don't trust God? What's happening? Bart in his church dogmatics says that, I'm going to try to draw as I read the quote. Faith does not realize anything new. It does not invent anything. It simply finds that which is already there for the believer and also for the unbeliever. It is simply man's active decision for it, his acceptance of it, his active participation in it. This constitutes the Christian. And believing the Christian owes everything to the object of his faith, that is to God. This distinguishes the Christian from the non-Christian. The object... Jesus Christ is like a circle enclosing 
every human being and every individual man or woman. And in the case of the Christian, this circle closes with the fact that he believes. In the case of the non-Christian, it is still open <coughs> at this point where he ought to believe or does not believe or no longer believes. The unbeliever has not accepted the relationship which is already in relationship to him. He is abnormal in this respect, and faith is the normalizing of the relationship between man and this object. You think of it this way. If this, if this, well, yeah, the, the circle here is Jesus, right? And the circle includes all of humanity. Faith is accepting that one is inside the circle, recognizing that one is within the circle, that one is in relationship to Christ, that God is medicine Christ, and accepting that by saying, I trust you, and I am grateful to you for this gift. Unbelief, you're still inside the circle. God has still met you in Christ because God has met the whole world in Christ. You've just not responded to it. The circle is open. And this already uh, begins to, you know, we, we get close to Bart's universalism, which will be a, a topic for future classes. Um, but that's how Bart would explain unbelief. So, uh, God included, still met you. You just in, not said yes. Included yes. in unbelief, would there be any religion that doesn't believe in Jesus? Because obviously Jews and yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think that um, included in unbelief would be um, you know, whatever is lacking this disposition. Disposition is the wrong word, but this orientation of trust in God and Jesus Christ, and that I take it because God could possibly speak through a dead dog and use the dead dog to speak the word of Jesus. God can use other religions to speak the word of Jesus too. Um, I think that what yeah. about other religions is that other religions don't, um, other religions, when they come into conflict with Christianity, when, like, you have another religion that says, um, you know, the answer is X, not Y, and Y is the Christian answer, and X is the, is the non-Christian answer, Bart would, Bart would just say, no, it's got to be Y, 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 and he says this, not he doesn't just say this because he thinks he's right. He says this because he wants for people to be able to rely on the revelation of God in Christ, because he really has a concern that if you're just imagining a God and you don't read this God through Jesus, you're just going to imagine like a big serial killer or something like that. I mean, the idea of a higher power who would make a world like this, a world of the Holocaust, is just a serial killer. For Bart, he really wants you to be able to trust that God has been revealed in Jesus and that it was all right. Right, but that way you can give your life to this God and not worry that this God is out to get you. Um, and to do that, you have to say that yes, everything that Jesus revealed about God was true. And so, if any other religion comes into conflict with it, if any other philosophy comes into conflict with it, that philosophy or that religion is wrong. But there are a number of things about which other religions and philosophies speak that are not in the form of X, not Y, Y being the Christian answer. They just say something like, C major or uh, or just you know A B C D E F G. They're on the, the other religions speak about dimensions of life, dimensions of God, about which Christianity actually says very little. Father Peter is very eloquent about this um, with regard to Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism, which have much more elaborate understandings of the human body and the body's relationship to the spiritual life than does Christianity. Christianity just doesn't say a lot about it. Um, does that make some sense? So he, he's not, he doesn't think that we're just all going up the same mountain and basically all of our answers are the same deep down. He thinks that religions can conflict with one another, that there's an actual conversation and debate to be had among religions, but he believes that the God of Jesus can speak through these other religions. And so that's why I don't think that that would constitute unbelief. I think that unbelief is like, you consciously or unconsciously refuse to turn your life over to God in trust. And that's different from like saying, I believe in Jesus versus, um, I believe that Jesus was the son of God 
and was um, and actually died <laughs> on Good Friday and then was resurrected, as opposed to saying about Jesus what a Muslim would say about Jesus, which is that he was a prophet, he was the Messiah, he's coming back at the end of the ages. He didn't actually die on the cross. Muslims don't believe that Jesus actually died on Good Friday. Um, he didn't die, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make some sense? Um, I have a question. <clears throat> Do we have time, Justin? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, do you think Bart wrote this at the time, probably did, when Germany was under Nazification, Nazism? Mm -hmm. And do you think he got the urge to write this so that we could trust in God to help us through this terrible time? Mm. Uh, the, the answer is, um, Amali, that he does have the Nazification of Germany in mind. It's happening right after. Um, so the way that Bart's life works, Bart's born in Switzerland, trained in Switzerland, teaches at the University of Bonn in Germany, uh, Hitler comes to power, Bart refuses to sign a pledge of allegiance to Hitler, uh, Bart is involved in the organizing of what's known as the Confessing Church, which is an underground church of Christians who are in resistance to Hitler, uh, when the state church of Germany, the Lutheran church of Germany, was synced up with Hitler and pledged allegiance to him. Uh, Bart, because he wouldn't sign this pledge, has to move back to Switzerland, flees Germany, goes back to Switzerland. This is taking place in um, the summer of 19... Oh, 40, 47, 47. Thank you. 1947. So he's gone back to the, to the university in Germany where he was teaching before Hitler came to power to do a summer semester. He'll never teach full-time there ever again, but he does do some summer courses. This was one of his summer courses. And so he's, he's in the aftermath of Nazification. And this is, one, this is a big reason why he's all about that downward arrow, right? It's all about God to the world because if you leave human beings to our own devices, we do things like this awful thing. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Molly. Brandon. In, in the same spirit, uh, it plays in spite of, yeah. and your reference to the Holocaust. Yeah. It, it, in, my, in my view, and I know, I know we're not talking about the others, but, but Kellick, Niebuhr, Bonhoeffer, Bart, C.S. Lewis, they're all people of an era that was a major conflict, 30 years plus, huge death and destruction. Mm -hmm existential in the extreme totally and all of them are very intense correct right? all of them mm -hmm. all of them are very focused yep. and then none of them are particularly wishy-washy no yeah. so so there's a is it not true that a, a, a lot of, of of what we're learning about bart and his theology is because of the clarity enforced by the context if you will the context of the age mm -hmm. and that the muddle if there's a muddle, might come later in others when the world becomes more relative, yeah. more abstract, more wishy-washy. Uh, there's, there's more choices. So these, these people did not grow up in an era of a menu of choices. No. Yeah. no. That's I, really I, good. I don't know if yeah. question or question, though, totally right. Well, you, you've led us to just the place where I wanted to end, which is... Wait, this is, wait, wait, wait. This is... The, Sorry. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> no, I am. I am very much. I have to end at noon because I'm preaching at twelve oh five. Uh, okay. And I want to hear Mozart. Um, but please hold your question for next time. I'll start with you, Marcia, next week. Uh, but I'll forget by tomorrow. <laughs> you can email it to me. Um, <laughs> but Brandon, that's that's, good. that's the key in the tempo in which he's writing. And what I want to propose is that this is the key in the tempo in which we should write today, in which we should be living today, right? We are, we are in the wake, we're just in the wake of a whole lot of stuff. I'm not going to give you a laundry list because I want to play Mozart. Uh, but I, I think that we are past that moment of an infinite number of choices in an era of like unprecedented prosperity, peace, etc. cetera, right? Um, we, I think this is the key in the tempo we need to go back to thinking and believing in. Um, and I get comfort for it because it's all <laughs> God to the world. I get comfort from Bart, not just the clarity, but the clarity that he has that God is there to help you and God's promises, I am there for you. I mean, it's just, it just, it makes me, want, it makes me, it makes me okay. Uh, there's a, there's this wonderful quote from the, from the church dogmatics that says that faith is at once the most wonderful and the simplest of things. 
In it, man opens his eyes and sees and accepts everything as it objectively really is. Faith is the simple discovery of the child which finds itself in the father's house and on the mother's lap. Yeah. Faith is just waking up and discovering, oh my gosh, I am in my father's house and I am on my mother's lap. And for Bart, he found that Mozart's music did this for him. Uh, So um, he wrote, I told you last time that he wrote a letter to Mozart. (laughs) Santa Claus letter. Wrote a letter to Mozart in heaven. And I'm going to just, I'm going to be reading you all some portions of this letter and some of the other things he's written about Mozart before I play you these pieces at the end of class. Um, Bart says here to Mozart, what I want to thank you, Mozart, for is simply this. Whenever I listen to you, I am transported to the threshold of a world in which sunlight and storm, day and night, is a good and ordered world. And then as I find myself a human being of the 20th century, back to Brandon, back to Molly, I always find myself blessed with courage, not arrogance, tempo, not a wearisome purity, peace, but not a slothful peace. With an ear open to your musical dialectic, one can be young and become old, can work and rest, be content and sad and short, one can live. But it's that I am transported to the threshold, right? The music just, boom. And that's just waking up, opening your eyes, and accepting that you're in the father's house and on your mother's lap, that God is there for you. 